Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Rock Herzich will defend the academic thesis, the role of the European Union enlargement in mortality convergence across Europe. May I invite you to present a summary of your thesis and the conclusions of your work. Thank you very much. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear colleagues, friends and family, both present here as well as watching online, good afternoon and welcome. This year marks 20 years since the 2004 enlargement of the European Union. With 10 countries joining, it was the largest enlargement in EU history and a milestone in European geopolitics. Eight, eight of the new member states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Czechia, Hungary, and Slovenia, are located in Central and Eastern Europe and had, at the time, only recently regained their independence. This dissertation focuses primarily on the experience of these eight countries. The enlargement was the conclusion of a 15-year accession process, which arguably began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. For the eight countries, it included the signing of the so-called Europe Agreements, followed by the official application for EU membership, and a lengthy process of adopting EU law and institutions. The international agreements that form the European Union mandate its institutions to foster economic, social, and territorial cohesion between member states and regions. This includes reducing differences in living standards and differences in quality of life. As part of this effort, the new member states received significant financial assistance to develop their institutions and critical infrastructure, both before and shortly after accession. However, this enlargement has largely failed to tackle the health disparities on the European continent, in particular, the east-west mortality gap. Here, it is illustrated as a gap in the period life expectancy at birth, which is the average number of years a person can expect to live based on the mortality rates observed in that year. Originating in the late 1960s, the mortality gap across the former Iron Curtain persists to today. While all countries in the enlarged EU enjoyed increases in life expectancy, the gap between life expectancy in the established, here illustrated in blue, and new member states, illustrated in red, has largely remained the same over the past three decades. This is astounding, given the political and economic integration these countries participated in and the resources that have been expended. And as somebody born and raised in one of the new member states, it also feels fundamentally unjust. The persistent mortality gap thus presents a very interesting scientific challenge and considering the EU's mandate for territorial cohesion, also an urgent political problem. The good news is, is that learning from past examples, including reunified Germany illustrated on this slide, we know that mortality gaps can close in response to political and economic integration. We call this process mortality convergence. French demographers Jacques Vallant and Franz Meslet hypothesized that mortality gaps emerge when some populations, the vanguards or the frontrunners, embrace certain innovations that help them reduce mortality, while other populations, the laggards, fail to do so. These mortality gaps then close when laggards catch up in adopting these mortality-relevant innovations. Examples of these innovations include new medical procedures, better health screening programs, as well as more rigorous public health legislation, for example, laws limiting smoking or alcohol consumption. However, mortality divergence convergence theory remains unclear about the underlying process of the emergence and spread of these innovations, and as such, does not explain the role of supranational, supranational events like EU enlargements, nor the role of national and regional contexts as they interact with supranational dimensions. Based on these empirical and theoretical challenges, I set out to investigate the role of the 2004 enlargement in mortality divergence convergence in the post-2004 EU, as well as formulated these two specific research questions written on this slide. Before addressing the research questions, however, I had to do my homework. I developed a theoretical framework and approach to measuring mortality convergence in the EU and reviewed the previous literature on the topic. Then, I addressed the first research question by estimating the direct effect of the 2004 EU enlargement on mortality convergence across the continent. 
Finally, I addressed the second research question by exploring the mechanisms underlying mortality convergence and finally, exploring a potential policy intervention that could speed it up in the EU context. Throughout the dissertation, I used a variety of sources um, of data and analytical approaches, but I focused mainly on developing statistical models. Now, studying mortality patterns reminded me a little of icebergs. We can clearly see the mortality gaps, but it's hard to know what's happening underneath. Mortality divergence convergence theory is the central tool that we currently have for describing the evolution of mortality gaps, but I also alluded to some of its limitations. To fill these gaps, I sought insight from other, si uh, other areas of social science. First, I learned from policy transfer scholars. They identified the various mechanisms through which policy ideas and other innovations spread between different countries, and which of these mechanisms were particularly relevant in the context of the 2004 EU enlargement. Second, I turned to insights from social epidemiologists and health geographers who had been introducing complex systems thinking into their disciplines. They developed ways of describing and studying the way population health and uh, mortality conditions are generated as a result of complex interactions between populations and their natural and social environments. Finally, I also needed an approach to measuring mortality convergence that could deal with a large number of countries and regions at once that would reflect its dynamic nature and that would allow for statistical testing. Learning from regional economic development scholars, I adopted the measures of beta and sigma convergence, also illustrated on this slide. Beta convergence focuses on comparing the rate of growth between different regions. If the regions with initially poor performance improve faster than regions with initially better performance, the stage is set for convergence. Sigma convergence, on the other hand, focuses on changes in the distribution in performance, its dispersion over time. This can be measured by range or variance or other more complex measures of inequality that all have different characteristics and pros and cons. With these theoretical tools in hand, I embarked on a systematic review of the literature. I included studies that examine geographic differences in mortality, that used either beta or sigma convergence measures, and that focused on the European Union. Generally, Past studies found that regions and member states with initially poorer conditions improved faster than those with initially better mortality conditions. But there was little overall uh, reduction in overall geographic differences in mortality across the EU. And some studies even indicated a widening of these uh, differences. Overall, there was a lack of a uniform approach to both measuring and conceptualizing mortality convergence. Most studies did also not delve into the mechanisms or determinants of mortality convergence, opting instead for a purely descriptive approach. Most importantly, the question of whether EU enlargements speed up mortality convergence or not remained unanswered. So, I filled this gap in knowledge with my next paper. I used publicly available mortality data from, EU st uh, from the EU Statistics Office, Eurostat, and the Statistics Offices of Member States. I set up the study as an interrupted time series analysis and used a joint point regression as the main modeling approach. The way this analysis works is by following three steps, each step being an increasing abstraction of the trends in life expectancy and an emerging clearer picture of the process of mortality convergence or divergence. We start with a plot of trends in life expectancy. Here I illustrate the national trends for men, but they also looked, of course, at the trends for women as well as regional life expectancy trends uh, in selected countries. There are too many trend lines here to tell whether mortality converged or diverged during the period right after accession. The second step, therefore, is calculating a convergence measure. Here I illustrate unweighted variance that gives us a better indication of whether there may be convergence over time. And finally, I had to perform a statistical test of this trend, and I looked at the timing of where the trend invariance changed, including the uncertainty intervals, and whether these changes fall into the critical period right after accession. Across the various analyses, I did not detect any direct impacts of the 2004 enlargement on mortality convergence across the EU. Based on the theoretical framework I developed, I speculated that three mechanisms might be behind this result. First, most changes to the socioeconomic environment and policies, things that would usually influence mortality conditions, 
already occurred before the official accession in 2004. Second, social welfare and health policies, being outside the EU mandate, were largely excluded during the accession. And third, there may be important differences between regions and over time in any mortality effects of EU enlargement. And an interrupted time series analysis would simply not detect those. Now to test some of these ideas and theories and hypotheses, I examined district mortality trajectories in reunified Germany, which is the paradigmatic example of successful mortality convergence on this continent. Here, I was not primarily interested in the overall pattern of mortality convergence, but rather I wanted to highlight the role of individual districts as well as district characteristics in this process. I focused on districts because they provide, in my view, an interesting balance between diversity and socioeconomic conditions and they allow me to maintain a stable frame regarding history, culture, and major policies of the federal states. I use data from the, German, from the German regional mortality databases, and because districts can have small populations, I had to fill a few data gaps. I fill those with uh, the use of a novel Bayesian relational model. Then I categorized the district uh, mortality trajectories into four groups, based on their relationship to the national average life expectancy. The first group were districts that were falling ever further behind the national average. Second were districts that were behind, but managing to catch up. The third group were districts that were ahead of the national average, but losing that advantage. And fourth, there were districts that were increasingly pulling ahead. And this is also in order of the way that they're illustrated on this slide. To my surprise, I found a lot of variation in district mortality trajectories, even within the same federal states. This indicated that interesting district-specific stories were unfolding and that the process of convergence was more spatially complex than previously anticipated. For example, in the post-industrial area around the River Ruhr, I found districts across all four different mortality trajectory groups, despite them being neighbors and having a shared history and a shared set of regulations. Of course, I examined whether a district belonging to a particular mortality trajectory group dependent on its socioeconomic characteristics. And compared to districts with a mortality disadvantage, those with a mortality advantage had less long-term unemployment and higher taxable income throughout the study period. Illustrated here as the significant results. Finally, regional and national contexts shape mortality through shaping the experience and health of individuals. So, for the last paper, I took another page out of the German Unification Playbook. Improved pension incomes of East German pensioners were considered a critical event in achieving mortality convergence after unification. There were other factors, but this one is considered critical. I wondered what impact a similar policy could have had um, in the context of an enlarged EU. Therefore, I examined an idea called the EU-wide minimum pension policy. Unfortunately, the available data does not allow me to test this question or to answer this question directly. I therefore designed a, um, a slightly different approach called a scenario analysis. Instead of estimating the policy's direct effects, this approach assumes a protective effect of improving living standards based on uh, previous literature, especially in those with very low pension incomes. I then used this assumption to simulate what the best case scenario impact of this policy would have been on the east-west mortality gap compared to the current situation. The graph here shows life expectancy at 65 for four new member states compared to the established EU countries. Focusing on the example of Estonian men, it highlights the life expectancy gap as it currently is and under the scenario. And the results of the overall analysis show that under the assumptions of this study, an EU-wide minimum pension could have reduced the east-west mortality gap by a modest amount for men, while the change was not significant for women, indicating that the policy could have been helpful in closing the currently observed gap. Allow me to conclude. Drawing the line under all of the results that I presented, I found that regional and national contexts currently dominate EU activities when it comes to the pace of mortality convergence across Europe. To make further progress in understanding the mechanisms of mortality convergence, we need more quality data about the socioeconomic and health behavior characteristics of individuals, and we need to be able to link them with the characteristics of the places in which they reside. This would enable studies 
that examine how, how mortality develops over time in the relation to both individual characteristics as well as community characteristics and place characteristics. Simulation studies can provide further insights in the meantime and need to serve as a stopgap measure. The more comprehensive and holistic approach to measuring mortality convergence that I developed in chapters three and four will support future monitoring of spatial health and mortality inequalities and hopefully be picked up to be used for more effective decision making. Now finally, evidence in chapters four and five suggests that EU programs guaranteeing more equal living standards could be relevant for fulfilling the aims of territorial cohesion. Individuals and communities having enough resources seems to be critical for their ability to implement mortality relevant innovations that enable um, progress. Accomplishing this may mean a, an expanded EU mandate in social welfare and health policy, new EU legislation on these topics, and likely more financial support for new member states and candidate countries. The key question, of course, is whether we are ready to pay the price for greater health equity across the European Union. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I give the word back to the Prorector. Thank you very much for your presentation. We will now start with the opposition, and the opposition will be opened by the Chair of the Assessment Committee, Professor Paulus, Professor of Economics of Education and Healthcare at Maastricht University. Thank you, Prorector. Dear candidate, let me start by thanking you for your dissertation. It was a joy to read. It was interesting, sometimes challenging, but also very impressive. So I would like to congratulate you and your supervisory team with this achievement. As you can imagine, of course, while reading the dissertation also, some questions arose. And I would like to start with some questions related to chapter two. And you also nicely presented that you had to do some homework, so you, one of the things you did was starting with a literature review. Now I want to start with a very short question. And we know that there are all kinds of literature reviews, from systematic to scoping, from integrative to realist reviews. You opted for a systematic literature review. Could you just indicate why, of all of these different types of reviews, was this the most suitable one? And if so, why? Highly esteemed opponent, first of all, thank you very much for your very kind words. Um, and thank you very much for your question as well. I opted for a systematic literature review because I did want to present um, the readers and in the process of the project, I also needed information on just the overall situation of knowledge um, regarding mortality convergence. I initially even endeavored to um, pursue a meta-analysis or a meta-regression. Mm -hmm. However, given the methodological heterogeneity that I alluded to it and that uh, I described in the discussion, mm -hmm. um, this was simply not possible. I could have considered um, other approaches as well. For example, a scoping review might be an interesting endeavor in this, uh, in this mm -hmm. regard. Um, however, I felt that having as rigorous uh, as possible approach to both the search as well as the synthesis of the results was uh, the best step to be taken in at, at the moment. Yeah, and I assume that you then choosing, uh, let's say, a systematic review, that you also try to apply all of the guidelines that are present for systematic reviews. Um, did you follow those guidelines or can you say something about that? Indeed. Um, I did endeavor to report the systematic review in, uh, in accordance uh, to PRISMA guidelines, okay. the PRISMA reporting yep. guidelines, um, and I did follow some of the uh, Cochrane Handbook and uh, Joanna Briggs Institute uh, um, recommendations when one is approaching literature reviews. Yeah. Now I also saw, and it is uh, very nice that you appraised the quality of the studies, uh, and. Um, you finally included seven studies and appraised uh, the quality, and you used three criteria for that, so three types of bias. Um, the selection bias, the reporting bias, and the time bias. Uh, and you define time bias as an artificially short period. Um, I want to invite you to explain that a little bit more. What is an a, a artificially short period, and mm -hmm. what would then be a good period? let's yeah. say, and what, uh, what would be then a long period or an acceptable period? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? I'm asking because I saw that 
uh, at least six out of seven studies uh, have this issue. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Certainly. Thank you for, for this question. When I was considering, the, in particular, this criterion, um, I was looking at, on the one hand, the availability of mortality data uh, at the time of publication of the study, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then, on the other hand, the time period that the study was examining. Yep. And in the case that um, a study decided to really look only at a particular smaller time period, I decided to designate it as, uh, as limited according to this criterion. But of course, this was from the perspective of my research question, which yeah. was focused on uh, a very long-term uh, yeah. trajectory in uh, convergence and divergence in, in mortality. Of course, that does not mean that the studies uh, themselves were limited in terms of answering their particular research questions. Yeah, and then uh, actually you noted that the quality of all studies was either minimum high qua bias, um, and you also rightly say it's a, a very heterogeneous field of research. Um, so uh, I was wondering, uh, if you had to do this review again, would you approach it differently also given all these biases and the quality of these studies? Or would you use other sources perhaps, or include maybe grey literature or these kinds of... Yeah. Did you think about those options as well? Yeah. With the benefit of hindsight, um, I mean, I would answer this in two parts, uh, okay. if I may. Yeah, um, sure. I think according to the research question that I was attempting to answer, I think the approach that I took was the appropriate one. Mm -hmm. um, however, if I was looking to perhaps provide um, a really expensive overview without any attempt to synthesize the results themselves in, a, in any kind of quantitative or qualitative mm -hmm. way, perhaps a scoping review would have been better. Um, I did endeavor to include as much great literature as possible. Uh, I did include some uh, EU reports, for example, yeah. which were not otherwise published as scientific papers. Um, however, there are also other studies, especially studies at the national level, that looked at uh, regional convergence within particular countries. And I think uh, revisiting this literature review um, now at the 20th uh, anniversary of the enlargement mm -hmm. might be uh, an interesting endeavor uh, perhaps with a slightly uh, larger team, yeah. this, is, this is, could be something that uh, we could uh, accomplish. Yeah. Well, thank you for that reflection. Um, I would also like to discuss with you, uh, looking at the topic also on, on this slide, um, talking about divergence and convergence uh, between different countries. Now, we know that there are a lot of migration flows between countries. And I was wondering, how do they impact this type of research? And what does this imply for migration policies if we look at the results of your studies? Thank you, you very much. Reflect on that. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for this question. I, I think this is, this is really a fundamental question when yeah. it comes to uh, cross-national comparisons of mortality rates or mortality indicators, uh, especially over broad periods of time and across uh, the continent. We know that the enlargement was, uh, to some extent, uh, accompanied by a large flow of uh, migrants from east to west. I think the, the latest um, estimates that I saw uh, put, it, put this at about three and a half million, uh, million persons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, of course, this is, this is an important circumstance that has to be taken into account. Um, now, again, there's a, there's a two-part answer to this. Uh, the first part that I, I would say is that in all of the studies I had to rely, or I did rely, on the national estimates um, that were available to me at the time, as well as regional estimates. Now, these might be biased or not. However, given the limited, uh, um, let's say, the incomplete registration of uh, migration, um, there might be some bias inherent in those. However, I would um, hasten to add that most of these migrants tended to be relatively young, 18 to 30, mm -hmm. uh, usually in um, you know prime working age uh, persons, who, um, given uh, our focus on life expectancy at birth or life expectancy at 65 would not have contributed so much uh, to, the, to the count of uh, deaths or skew uh, our uh, overall results. There are, there are some studies, for example, uh, looking at um, migration flows and their impact on life expectancy in, in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, also accounting for east-west migration flows, and they found uh, errors of, uh, of about uh, 0.5 to 1 year of life expectancy. And given 
given the, the trends that we're observing here, of course, this would change them somewhat, but it would not invalidate the overall conclusions of the studies. Thank you very much. Um, well, given time, I think I'll give the word back to the prorector. Thank you for your answers. Thank you very much, Professor Paulus. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Van Wissel, also a member of the assessment committee. He's Professor of Economic Demography at the University of Groningen. Thank you. Dear candidate, uh, first, congratulations with a fine piece of work. I think you show in this dissertation that you are well capable of being a full-fledged researcher applying uh, sophisticated methods in, to a very important field. Uh, I think, yeah, differences in, in health and, and mortality, life expectancy, are among the most fundamental differences and inequalities among mankind, I think. So it's very, very well that this is addressed and also taking into account the role of the European Union uh, in that. Um, having said that, I have a few questions and remarks that I hope we will exchange some ideas in the coming minutes. And my, <clears throat> my first question is about the significance of the year 2004 uh, indeed, that's the year when the countries that you studied uh, uh, entered the European Union. As you conclude, there is a significant, well, there is a convergence already since, since the 90s, uh, taking into account the first years after uh, the, the big transformation and in the 80s, well, but, but since the middle of the 90s, something happens indeed in the right direction. But there is no clear break in the time trend in 2004, and this is to a large extent, as you explain yourself well, um, by the fact that many pre-accessing steps were already in place, uh, anticipating what would be happening, and leading to convergence already long before that. Um, and I think if you look at the pictures, you also show that here, uh, it, 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 it looks clear. But in order to test that assumption formally, you would need the evidence of a control group, I would say. Uh, and that would be a group of, say, Eastern European countries that did not enter the EU European Union, uh, such as Russia, Ukraine. Well, it's very funny in a sense to mention these two countries now in the same group, but anyway, also Georgia or maybe a couple of other countries. And then my question, uh, have you considered such a research plan? And if yes, why have you not implemented that? Highly esteemed opponent. Thank you very much for the congratulations and the questions that you presented. I agree with you that um, the significance of 2004 as a particular breaking point um, is a choice. It was a methodolo methodological choice that uh, I pursued. Um, the reason why I decided for this particular approach using interrupted time series analysis and really looking at the period 2004 until 2007 as, uh, as part of the statistical methodology was because uh, there's, there, there is, a, of course, an intensification of EU programs after accession. Naturally, as you rightly point out, there was a lot of activities and a lot of changes in the um, then candidate countries and then new member states. Also, during the pre-accession period, there's uh, no doubt about that. Um, lots of political changes, economic changes, of course, changes in policy. Um, but I was particularly interested in does the, uh, does the intensified access to both cohesion funds as well as the intensified access to uh, various uh, expert fora, um, you know, more, more intensified uh, um, collaboration with established member states, does this by itself really have a significant uh, effect? Um, on the other hand, it was to some extent a pragmatic choice and uh, I completely acquiesced to this. Um, now, the question of doing a controlled interrupted time series analysis using uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, perhaps Georgia, other countries as uh, control, uh, control subjects is a very interesting idea. Um, however, at the, at the time of designing the study, I decided against it uh, because of the question of self-selection. Um, I did not necessarily feel that these other countries would really function uh, very, very well as uh, control, 
uh, as control units for the countries that I was looking at. Um, now, an alternative to this approach might have been um, creating s synthetic controls, for example, from the experience of, of these other countries. However, um, this is an approach I have yet to, to master and uh, perhaps is something to uh, explore in the future. Okay. Yeah, well, well point, well taken indeed. Uh, but, 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 but still, I mean, upon first reading, uh, you, you, you might get the impression that, that it's sort of a negative conclusion, sort of an EU accession didn't mean anything, but, but lots of implicit or explicit things might have happened already. So it might not be as bleak as you point out in a sense. Sort of, uh, so that, that, that's sort of the side effect of, of your approach in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I, I, I agree that, that this, 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 this control group has some problems uh, indeed if you would have used it, yeah, for sure. Okay, well, continuing my small list of issues that I have in front of me. Um, in the first chapter, you give a nice overview of the issues around mortality convergence and also explained in your introduction today. Um, convergence in divergence convergence theory by uh, Masle, uh, Valais and Maslet uh, may come about because of Vanguard's adopting... Uh, uh, well, the, the divergence comes uh, because of Vanguard sort of uh, running out uh, uh, before the peloton, uh, running off with increased life expectancies, whereas laggards do not yet adopt. And convergence is if these laggards arrive later, no new innovations, but they just catch up in a sense. Okay, that is a, although you also correctly mentioned that there are some problems with that. Why is this process going on like that? But it is a nice framework, a theoretical framework. So I like it very much. Um, but then you, in your methodological chapters, well, I said chapter two and three, for instance, you use beta and sigma convergence. In my opinion, that doesn't sort of uh, align exactly with that theory. I mean, you would, might say beta convergence is sort of laggards sort of catching up uh, to, towards the, 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 the mean, uh, sort of a regression to the mean sort yep. of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the other part of, of the theory uh, sort of diverges because of uh, Vanguard's uh, sort of uh, running off is not very, very well taken into account in beta convergence. So, so why the choice of this uh, sort of methodological tool, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm well aware of the tool because I use it myself in the past as well, so, but, but it, I, do you agree that, that it doesn't fit exactly to the valais meslet framework? and uh, what could be done about it? Thank you very much for, for this question. Um, I agree that there is work to be done on operationalizing the theoretical framework uh, that, that I presented. Um, I would argue that the beta and sigma convergence approaches are very helpful pragmatic tools that we have in, in this regard, uh, especially if they're taken together. Uh, and this is something that I uh, made pains to emphasize throughout the dissertation, that uh, focusing only on beta convergence on on, or only on sigma convergence is simply insufficient to presenting us a holistic picture of what is happening in terms of mortality differences uh, over time. <coughs> and uh, therefore, beta convergence indeed perhaps emphasizes the experience of laggards, and it gives us a, a glimpse into what can we expect in the future, and perhaps uh, if it does indicate, the analysis does indicate con uh, beta convergence, the stage is only set for convergence itself. And that is why it's so critical to also have the sigma convergence perspective in there to see whether the differences are indeed getting smaller or not. Because beta convergence by itself um, is an interesting tool, it's a useful tool, but it's an incomplete tool. But uh, allow me to also comment on where I feel uh, the uh, future improvements could come in. Um, I would say, um, we could emphasize a bit more uh, the specific mortality relevant innovation story that uh, the, demographer, that the two demographers have been emphasizing and perhaps try to model or at least explore or quantify the process of implementation a, a bit more or describe it uh, numerically somehow. Um, and I think uh, there are ample opportunities uh, from, uh, from findings in implementation science, etc., that would allow us to couple this. Right. I, I think we, we need to find a way of merging the macro level perspective with the micro level or even the meso institutional level perspective here to really give us a holistic representation of what is, uh, what is happening. So, so this is what I would endeavor to do uh, in the future as well and perhaps hopefully then develop tools that are uh, even better 
that uh, beta and sigma convergence uh, or delta convergence taken all together? I couldn't agree more. I, I do think that the demography, if there's one sort of distinctive element in, into this discipline, is to link the macro and to, the, the micro and the macro level uh, together. Yeah. And uh, that, that is, that's a good program for the future, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I see the rector. Okay, well, okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Professor Van Wissen. Uh, we continue with the opposition. The next opponent is uh, also a member of the assessment committee. It's Professor Bosma, Professor of Social Epidemiology at Maastricht University. Thank you. Uh, dear candidate, let me first congratulate you with this uh, accomplishment. And in this praise, I also like to include your uh, team of uh, supervisors. I think your work is innovative, uh, both content-wise and methodologically. Uh, it's, uh, but at, at the same time, the findings are in a certain way disappointing, uh, in the sense that it appears difficult to find convergence uh, between uh, the different countries in, after the EU enlargement. And the Eastern and Central European countries keep lagging behind uh, and keep having higher mortality statistics. It, it appears not much different from the time when I was looking at the same things, uh, but then a uh, longer time ago in the 1990s. So not much has changed, and the EU apparently does not, did not help. Um, so you bring very convincing evidence how difficult it is to change uh, certain population uh, statistics and population health. Uh, but of course, I also have some questions. Uh, you look at sex differences uh, when you compare the countries uh, and uh, it is not further elaborated why you look particularly at the differences between men and women. And one of the things that I immediately missed, I thought, well, if he looks at the differences between men and women, it might, in a certain way, I would say, also look at socioeconomic differences. And might there be, uh, one of the questions could, for example, be, uh, would the EU enlargement be more beneficial maybe for the low socioeconomic groups, or would it be more beneficial for the high socioeconomic groups, uh, to see whether maybe the major socioeconomic differences that are larger in life expectancy, that are larger between socioeconomic groups than between men and women, whether the EU enlargement maybe has decreased these inequalities. And so I wondered, uh, why did you not look at these social economic differences in health and compare whether, or check whether there is convergence, there is smaller narrowing or something like that in, in, in bad countries? Mm Highly -hmm. esteemed opponent, thank you very much for these, uh, these questions as well as the opening remarks. I really appreciate them. I could not agree with you more. The socioeconomic differences aspect is uh, very interesting uh, and it's something that I would love to pursue in the future as well. Um, however, in the thesis, I primarily focused on the territorial dimension, on the spatial differences and the spatial dimension. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, by introducing, uh, by, by looking at regional differences and even district level differences, uh, as it did uh, in the case of reunified Germany, it does give us some indication because we do see some level of uh, not agglomeration, but um, let's say um, um, migration is not completely, let's say, blind to socioeconomic status of, uh, mm -hmm. of persons, right? And we see this in, uh, in Eastern Europe quite a bit, where uh, there's simply uh, uh, entire regions, uh, post-industrial regions uh, that used to thrive on you know, coal production, steel production, etc., that still have sizable populations. Of course, there was a lot mm -hmm. of out-migration there but now sort of represent uh, a certain socioeconomic layer, uh, if, if I may uh, speculate uh, to, to some extent in this regard. So, so I do feel, um, the, uh, so I do think that the dissertation provides some glimpse into uh, what uh, we could expect if we did socioeconomic uh, comparisons between groups uh, at the socioeconomic level, um, but of course it does not address this question directly. Um, I would, I would also but, like to... But, but maybe, maybe I can f phrase the question differently. Uh, if one would look at socioeconomic differences in health in a country, 
would you expect the after the EU enlargement that the inequalities in health in a, in the countries that uh, were added to the EU whether they decreased what would you expect would they decrease or would they increase because of the enlargement yeah i currently would have what we would call clinical equipoise in this question because i can i can see mechanisms that would uh, cause inequalities to increase for example capital regions tend to be more plugged into the globalized liberalized economy i, I feel it's easier for them to <coughs> gain advantages um, i mean the current economy is really uh, um, some one that prioritizes uh, persons with higher educational attainment which tend to also come from uh, families with previously higher education attainment and higher socioeconomic positions. So one could make a case that uh, as uh, we increasingly liberalize our economies, and this is what the EU project has been uh, largely about, we might see increases in socioeconomic differences. On the other hand, of course, the cohesion program does specifically target uh, regions with uh, lower GDPs, right? I think the cutoff is still 0.75 of the, of the average, which tends to really concentrate on most... Uh, disadvantaged uh, regions uh, in, in the new member states. Um, so one could expect some benefit uh, uh, to lower socioeconomic groups from, from that address. Yeah. Um, so, 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 I, so it I, could bo go both ways. I think it could go both ways. Yeah. So this is why I think it would be very important for us to test this question empirically. Mm -hmm. yeah, because it, it, it co there is an, another body of evidence showing that uh, inequalities in health are everywhere, mm -hmm. or almost. Uh, stabilizing or increasing yep. so it's widening so in that sense one could say maybe the eu enlargement did not do much but i do not know so much about the how that developed in the eastern and central european countries but maybe an, an additional question is about what i know from multi-level uh, research is that when i'm always surprised about that and, and i understand the the uh, the ease of looking at regions or neighborhoods or something like that, instead of at looking at individuals. But if you, in a multi-level analysis, if you uh, do such analysis, you will always find that 95% or more of the variance in the health outcome is, uh, is within a region or is within a neighborhood. And only 5% is between regions or neighborhoods and maybe on the regional level it's maybe even more pronounced it's maybe even more than 97 95 percent that uh, the health differences are within uh, between individuals actually so the differences between regions are much more smaller than the differences between individuals within a region that is what i wanted to say and do you not think it is important to particularly in that indeed at the micro level and also the the individuals to your analysis might looking at the regions not be yeah not maybe neglecting somehow also the people who are in poor conditions living accidentally in richer areas or richer regions or something like that if one would only focus on the poor areas mm -hmm. so in the so what do you think, would it not be necessary to include the individual level? Thank you, thank you very much for this, uh, for, for this elaboration. I, I completely agree with you. And this is something that I would really love to do. However, mm -hmm. including the individual dimension uh, at, this, uh, at this scope of both countries and over time was simply not possible at the moment. But I do yeah. hope to pursue this in the future. Good to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bosma. Um, the next opponent is also a member of the assessment committee, Dr. Ebeling, epidemiologist from the Max Planck Institute Rostock in Germany. Uh, thank you, Prorector. <clears throat> Let me also uh, use the chance to congratulate you and also your collaborators for this fine piece of work. Um, I think your thesis um, shows very careful research work that uh, could serve to upcoming PhD students as an example how one you know, does scientific work, and I think it also has a very high level of critical thinking, uh, which I find very impressive, so congratulate you. You yourself 
have shown in your presentation here and also um, in, in your thesis yourself, you discuss all the time these mechanisms. And here you have shown the iceberg and that we just see the peak of the iceberg. And um, when I think of death, I think death is the peak of the iceberg. And usually a death follows uh, a certain individual di disease history. Persons have diseases and more diseases and at some point too many diseases and they die. And um, you and your concept and framing, one of the central arguments that you have is that there are mortality relevant in innovations, as you call them. So I would like to hear a few concrete examples from you how the European Union enlargement, which specific innovations would bring this enlargement in order to interact with the individual disease histories to generate um, some sort of mortality improvement. Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and thank you very much for, for these questions. I agree that not only the individual dimension but also the life course dimension, uh, including the morbidity dimension or perhaps more attainably the cause, cause of death dimension would be all very interesting expansions uh, of, the, uh, of the body of work I presented uh, today. Um, I think uh, pertaining specifically to your, uh, to your question, what mechanisms of enlargement could really help us uh, bridge the gap? I think it's important for us to reflect on the fact that uh, a large part of the current gap is determined by uh, cardiovascular disease mortality. Um, so, so I think that's one component. Uh, knowing what we know about um, socioeconomic determinants of cardiovascular mortality, but also um, the specific uh, medical interventions that could uh, help us intervene in the process. Um, I think overall the European Union could, can play a role in this, in this regard, right? because the European Union uh, creates uh, space for expert uh, fora. So that would be what I would imagine is, um, a mechanism that uh, speeds up uh, the diffusion of specific innovations. Um, on the other hand, the European Union at least aims to pursue territorial cohesion. That means uh, increasing the resources, not, not just in, in this kind of um, disembodied GDP sense, but you know, uh, looking at what this uh, actually means, it probably means new hospitals, better hospitals, perhaps better access to healthcare, uh, these kind of things. But I, um, I'm afraid I can't give you a completely satisfactory uh, explanation here, right? Because I think that dimension of, um, uh, between uh, EU enlargement, uh, policy transfer, so this link I made, but between policy transfer and then specific implementation on the ground, um, I think this is something that still needs to be made to some extent. Okay. But I hopefully indicated a couple of ideas uh, for you. Yes, thanks. But I'm still trying to find the positive thing in your perhaps disappointing finding. And uh, in this respect, um, I was wondering, uh, maybe you agree or not, that maybe life expectancy is not the right measure to do that. Life expectancy is, is a quite big measure. It's a summary measure that takes all death rates into account that the population sees at a certain time point. And, and so we might lose the nuance and maybe miss the, the small good things that the EU enlargement have done. So would you think that your conclusions might change if we would study different health outcomes or just you know, minor parts of the um, age-specific mortality trajectory? Thank you for this, uh, for this reflection. Uh, if I may, I would answer it in sort of two points. Um, I, I would say, um, indeed, at first glance, the results seem disappointing, but that's because uh, the hypothesis I was testing also set a very high bar, right? Um, first of all, it's very hard to, uh, to see what the counterfactual would have been with these countries if they had not joined the European Union. Perhaps we would see greater divergence, and now at least we see kind of stagnation uh, of the differences. Um, Secondarily, I would say, um, yeah, the, the bar that I said was uh, relatively high because to actually achieve convergence, learning from historical examples was both extremely expensive, extremely uh, invasive, um, and perhaps not something that the EU is made for, right? So uh, I think that's, that's also something important uh, to note. Um, now, um, regarding alternative measures, Indeed, perhaps there were uh, improvements in uh, morbidity statistics, morbidity outcomes, uh, uh, these sorts of things. I think it would have been very interesting to, uh, to explore uh, convergence in these kind of measures. Um, to my understanding, uh, if one looks at uh, healthy life expectancy, one sees a very similar pattern to what I presented today. So unfortunately, in, in again, this kind of global indicator, not much good news. Um, uh, 
um, but perhaps for specific diseases, uh, if one considers the European reference networks and similar institutions, we might find very positive uh, so, uh, stories. Thank you. Uh, maybe one last um, question. Um, in your conclusion, you um, or you come to the conclusion that um, perhaps more influence of the European Union on health policies and so on and so forth um, could maybe foster some stronger convergence than the ones that you observe. And uh, I mean, more is always a good answer when there's a problem, but more is usually limited by resources. So if you would need to judge what you know, what priorities are really or should really be taken in order to you know, like um, perhaps um, improve the influence of the EU on national um, mortality trends. So what would be a ranking in that respect? Thank you very much. I also, uh, I also thought about this question quite a bit. Um, I do feel that the European Union, with, the, with its current emphasis uh, in the post-COVID era on uh, health system resilience, is making the right steps and targeting the right aspects, I feel, of, uh, of health systems. Uh, because what the COVID experience does show us is that, again, most of the downturn in life expectancy was concentrated in the new member states. Right? So it does tell us something about the resiliency and the capacity of their health systems to really respond to these novel challenges. And again, it just goes to show um, that there's still uh, a lot to be done there. So first of all, I would hope for more investment in health resilience. Um, but on the other hand, I think there's only so much that we can do with limited investment. If we compare the investment per person um, associated with the 2004 enlargement, with the German reunification, the factor uh, is 100 times bigger, right? So the cost of German reunification uh, and the investment of West Germany into the East per person is 100 times larger than what we see uh, during, uh, uh, during the EU enlargement, right? So, I mean, we can see some uh, improvements in terms of targeting, etc. but at the end of the day, with 1% of the effort, it's hard to achieve the, a similar result, I feel. Okay, thank you. I think that's a discussion that could go on for a long night. <laughs> With this, I give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ebeling. Uh, then uh, we come to the final opponent. It's Professor Kervers, Professor of Demographic Transition, Human Capital and Employment at Maastricht University. Thank you. Um, dear candidate, um, Congratulations on your very interesting book on mortality conversions in Europe, or should I say lack of mortality conversion within the European Union. At least um, the cover color of the book is in EU blue, which I really like, um, but which is in contrast a bit with your picture of gravestones. Um, your statistical analysis are very thorough, going deep into different forms of convergence between the old and new uh, EU member states. Despite your thorough uh, analysis, I have some uh, issues to raise. In fact, I'm a bit surprised by your analysis because I would ex have expected mortality rates to have fallen more in the new compared to the old uh, countries. Perhaps your thesis would have gained even more social relevance if you had analyzed more thoroughly the reasons why this did not happen. Um, now uh, to my questions. Um, well, in fact, uh, given the time uh, to, uh, to begin with. Um, it is well known that um, life expectancy is strongly correlated with educational level. I do not see this variable in your analysis. If the level of education rises in the new member states, life expectancy should also uh, rise. Do you know more about rising uh, educational attainment and closing the gap in relation to um, educational uh, attainment? And to what extent this may lead to a declining gap between um, uh, yeah, the old and the new member states regarding mortality rates in the future? That's my first question. Hi, listing opponent. Thank you very much for, for this question and your reflection at the very beginning. Um, I'm afraid that uh, the thesis did not focus uh, particularly on the compositional elements of the regions um, that would include educational attainment of the population. Uh, if I may speculate, um, I, would, I would argue that um, educational attainments uh, between the new member states and the, uh, and the established member states um, 
again speculating here, um, would not be the primary driver of the differences in life expectancy that you see and the trends in life expectancy. Let me just give you an example here. Uh, if we take the Baltic, uh, Baltic states here, um, the, the three Baltic uh, countries uh, all joined the EU at the same time. They have similar histories, uh, relatively similar levels of uh, economic development at the point, relatively similar in terms of uh, um, population composition, as far as I understand. However, we do observe very, very uh, distinct differences in the mortality trajectories, especially if one considers Estonia on the one hand and Latvia on the other hand. So uh, Estonia uh, is one of the example countries uh, from the new member states that very that seems to be uh, rapidly closing the gap compared to its Western counterparts, whereas Latvia and Lithuania don't seem to do so. Um, from the from the research uh, on this particular set of countries that uh, I know uh, and understand, um, researchers have uh, pinpointed uh, really health system characteristics as the primary drivers of these uh, mortality divergences in the Baltics and not so much compositional uh, factors. However, I completely agree that this is uh, an interesting uh, area of research uh, about which uh, I look forward to learning more. My, my second question is about, um, um, about uh, I wonder how a life expectancy at birth is calculated. Uh, There's a yeah, most important variable for you in the thesis, but uh, do you know more about infant mortality um, among newborns? Um, have you looked at mortality rates of different ages? Because I would particularly expect a rapid decline in mortality rates for very young people rather than for old ones, if, for example, hospital uh, healthcare improves. Thank you very much for this question as well. Um, my analysis did not focus on age differences uh, in terms of mortality convergence and divergence. I rather focused on life expectancy, as you rightly noted, uh, life expectancy at birth, as you rightly noted. Uh, from what I understand uh, in, in the literature, um, the current gaps uh, are dominated by, uh, by differences in mortality at older ages, particularly older ages due to cardiovascular disease, but increasingly so due to uh, mortality uh, uh, due to cancer. Um, my understanding of the literature is that um, the gaps in infant mortality rates have largely uh, been closed by, by the mid-90s or so, um, which indeed presents us with an interesting problem. Why are then we still seeing uh, these gaps and uh, how is it that hospital systems and hospital infrastructures still, um, uh, still seem to play such a crucial role uh, in the current gap that we're, that we're seeing? Um, I think there might be a couple of hypotheses that merit investigation here. Um, one question would be to what extent have the new member states managed to create uh, good systems of integrated care, which means do we, capture, uh, do we capture people at risk of cardiovascular disease and do we take them through the necessary steps throughout the system to really prevent uh, exacerbation of disease and then finally the worst exacerbation, which is death. So that could be one aspect of the health system that we have to look at. But I would also argue that primarily we uh, we see differences in uh, the effectiveness of uh, or the presence uh, of uh, or intensity of uh, primary prevention in these countries. Um, again, going back to the example of the Baltic states, uh, one of the specific differences that was pinpointed uh, is uh, alcohol legislation. Estonia tended to be at the forefront of adopting alcohol legislation. It managed to really reduce alcohol consumption as a result of this and mortality uh, improvements uh, followed soon after. Of course, we don't have causal evidence for this uh, at the moment, but it does give us a strong indication that it's not only the hospital systems that have to be improved, but really primary preventive measures, including uh, public health legislation that requires attention. Thank you for your very uh, interesting answer. Then I have a last question uh, before the Beagle comes. It is, um, um, I'm curious about fertility rates in the new accession countries. I've done a quick analysis and it seems that um, these have increased for many new member states between 2001 and 2011, unlike the old member states. So there seems to be convergence at first glance in uh, fertility, fertility rates. Often fertility rates follow dead rates in demographic transitions. Do you think the analysis of fertility rates could be useful in relation to the excesses, accession of the new member states? Thank you very much for this question. Uh, I do feel this is a, this is a very interesting um, area of investigation. Um, 
somewhat morbidly I focus on mortality and the end of life. However, um, I'm convinced that there's very interesting uh, work to be done looking at convergence and divergence also at, at the beginning of life. Um, however, in, in, in this regard, um, it does beg the question whether the traditional model of uh, demographic transition uh, is uh, still relevant uh, here at the moment. Perhaps it could be that, um, as some uh, of the recent literature uh, indicates, If you want to finish your answer shortly, yeah. you can do it. Thank you very much. Um, so some current literature does suggest that uh, there are various patterns of the, demo the, of the demographic transition, uh, not only across continents, but also across subcontinents and countries. So perhaps we are seeing a more complex picture here than what was normally expected or normally observed. Thank you. Who <laughs> asked? I repeat it. Uh, Rock Hirsich, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the mileage, Years 
Rok Hersic, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Brandt is authorized to, confirm, to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. First, I have to take an oath. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you her digit, Grok digit, I didn't learn it after four years, <laughs> the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached to it by law and custom. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector the secretary and the other members of this committee and affixed with the great seal of the university. Dear Dr. Rock, as the students will call you from now on, because they have the same problem with the family as, name as I have, <laughs> congratulations to your PhD, but especially congratulations to your family. I think that were some years where it's always the question at the dinner table, how is the status of the PhD? <laughs> um, and um, of course, this is not for me alone, but uh, on behalf of the other supervisors, Dr. Timo Clemens from Maastricht University and Dr. Tobias Vogt from Groningen University, we would like to congratulate. Dr. Rock, I think you should do this, have this as a trademark, yeah? because the students like you very much, your educational record is excellent, and perhaps you will have a YouTube channel with uh, Dr. Rock Explains. <laughs> so I think there are huge challenges in front of you. Every person is a natural experiment. So that is why medicine is so difficult. And you experience it by yourself, but you manage to turn this around after your studies you said, well, why not looking at natural experiments? So what are influences from X outside to uh, the people? And the re result was this thesis that we discussed today in a very interesting manner. Uh, and uh, I have asked the committee not to do, give you any job offers for some time because we need you in our team. And I see that looking around, we will have a lot of new natural experiments in the next years to come. So I think 
uh, unemployment will not be a question for you, unemployment in the meaning of having new research topics. When you ask elderly researchers about their research topic, they always start with the same sentence. They say, oh, I already did my uh, PhD on why cats can fly and I did this for 40 years. Um, so in a way, we are reluctant to change. On the one hand, I can understand that you are linked to this topic, but uh, let's say, being with you for several years now, I saw that you are one of those people who can look left and right and uh, see the connection between research and policy making. So uh, stick to natural experiments, but add to this, add other things to it so that uh, we can, when someone asks you later in 30 years, what is your research topic, you can say, yeah, I started with this and I moved to this and then I had this. So have different tools to do this. You are a highly efficient worker and you are very patient, that's rare. You even listen to my hour-long monologues that I gave to you uh, commenting on your uh, 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 work and you didn't complain. You were only asking, okay, let's go on. So that uh, is really helpful. You once defined your future interest in the area of political epidemiology, if I remember right. And yes, go for it. Establish this. And some will know what now comes. Have the reader, have the textbook, have the handbook, then have the conference on this and uh, start a society working on this and later even having the master on this. Then you have established your field. You are, you are uh, young enough to do this. In, uh, we did it here for two areas, it was health reporting and health literacy, we succeeded in 1.5 times in this, uh, so the chances are quite high and this should be your way to go. In summary, for all of us it was a pleasure working with you and your PhD has really proven that you are a researcher with high skills and that you are committed to research too. Please make the best out of your talent. And I hope that we can wrap up your thesis all together by an editorial about 20 years of EU enlargement. Because of the, let's say, the underlying, did it fail, did it succeed? Let's wrap it up. I think that's good. And in the end, go Dr. Rock, go. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hersic, I, <laughs> I pronounced that difficult name. Uh, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. I also congratula congratulate, of course, your family, uh, your colleagues, your friends with this achievement. I'd like to uh, congratulate the supervisor. Uh, and I'd like to thank the members of the degree committee. You are all present here, which is very nice so that we don't have online uh, people, um, as happens very often nowadays. So thank you very much for being here, especially uh, our guests from outside Maastricht, Professor van Wissen and uh, Dr. Ebeling. Thank you very much for coming here. Um, maybe I can say a little bit about the opinion of the committee about your defense. They were very satisfied with the way uh, you defended your thesis. You showed a lot of uh, broad knowledge, able to answer questions from different uh, fields, and uh, the committee really uh, appreciated that. I must say I uh, enjoyed the way uh, you uh, answered the questions with a lot of confidence. If you, if you sit so close to someone, you can see really the, uh, uh, the expression. And uh, right from the start, I was completely convinced that you would do very well, which you did. And that 
uh, despite the depressing cover of your thesis, I had it on my desk for some time. I have one. What kind of person is this that puts something like that on, on the cover? Uh, and uh, I hope uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there will be no progress in attaining uh, the diminishment of the uh, gap in the European Union and uh, that everything will uh, develop for the best. I wish you a lot of success in your future career. And with this, I'd like to close this academic ceremony. Recording stopped.